recording again. Here we go. Welcome everybody. Um, we're going to get going in a couple of minutes. Um, we'll let you know. Welcome. Okay, I think uh, we'll we'll get started. Um, I we're hoping that somebody else will pop in and join us in a second. Um, but I think that we should get going. We have a, an action-packed and amazing panel. Um, set up for us. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome. Glad you're all here. My name is Dr. Richard Norman, and uh, super excited for this panel today. It's another discussion in this curated series as part of the Sport Diversity and Race project that I'm heading up uh, with the support of Dr. Sherry Bradish. Uh, and it's to explore the tensions and challenges of diversity, race, and inclusion, and decolonization in sport and the sport industry. Uh, this event would not be possible without the support of the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University in partnership with the MLSE Foundation, MLSE Launchpad, and the Office of the Vice President of Equity and Community Inclusion. Um, and thank you. I, I, think, I see that Dr. Green has joined us now. So I have the distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Denise O'Neill Green, the Vice President for Equity, Community and, uh, sorry, Equity and Community Inclusion at Ryerson University, give an opening welcome, Dr. Green. Always gotta make sure you get that mute button off, right? <laughs> so thank you, Richard, and the Ted Rogers School of Management for including me in today's program. And uh, I hope I get everyone's name right. Thank you to Suzanne, uh, Charisse, Lisa, Shireen, and Sarah for contributing your time today for today's very important uh, panel discussion. On behalf of, of the university, uh, I'm pleased to be welcoming you all to this important discussion on the intersection of women, gender, and sport. It's clear that sports and athletics present an important opportunity to instill values such as hard work, discipline, and teamwork in its participants. It can also be a key strategy to increase health promotion, physical and psychological well being, and to counter school dropout rates, unemployment, and healthcare costs. But we must remember that sports are not detached from the rest of Canadian society. 
Rather, it's another institution that reflects and reinforces greater inequities and challenges, including issues related to gender inequality, transphobia, racism, and so on. When it comes to racism, in a report covering university athletics in Ontario, just released this week, I believe, uh, Dr. Uh, Janelle Joseph in the Indigeneity, Diaspora, Equity, and Anti-Racism in Sport Research Labs shared this very apt uh, quotation, open quote, stop believing racism is only at another school or at an, on another team. Racism is part of every OUA program, close quote. In 2021, the world of Canadian sports faces barriers and challenges that prevent girls and women from participating in sport and thus from reaping the numerous benefits. According to Canadian Women in Sports, issues range from the lack of media coverage, lack of diversity, underrepresentation of female leadership, pay inequity, trans inclusion, negative stereotyping, sexual violence, misogyny, and more. More generally, there are barriers to access facilities and programs, high quality programming, financial barriers, and entry and so on. At the intersection of race as shared by Dr. Joseph's team, racialized athletes are at the receiving end of everyday racism, microaggressions, discriminatory jokes and barriers to recruitment and promotion. And meanwhile, those who are not racialized and do not witness, hear or see racism firsthand are generally unaware how deep this problem is. Therefore, the lack of awareness and ignorance of racism in sport causes further harm in racialized, uh, to racialized athletes. Our esteemed panelists are sure to dive deeper into a variety of issues related specifically to women in sport at the intersections of race, disability, class, religion, gender, and so on. As part of my intro, I'd like to share some interesting insights I learned from a research report recently released by Canadian Women in Sport, <clears throat> excuse me, E-Alliance, Canadian Tire Jumpstart Charities and Sport Canada on the impact of COVID-19 in girls and young women in sport. The report found that roughly 93% of girls from the ages six to 12 who participated in sports weekly prior to the pandemic are playing less sports now than before the pandemic. And this number has increased for older girls from 13 to 18 years old. Every one in four girls who, whose participation in sports was negatively impacted, excuse me for a minute, Thank you. Every one in four girls whose participation in sports was negatively impacted by COVID-19 pandemic have shown no sign of resuming their participation in sports. That means a whopping 350,000 girls, young women in Canada won't be returning to sport. And to give you an idea of the scale of this issue is equivalent to every girl aged six to 18 years in Alberta opting out to play sports. This translates to girls missing out on many of the social, mental and physical benefits of sports, which could negatively impact them as they grow into adulthood. They're also missing out on the social connection and role modeling which play a critical role for girls. As more girls drop out, the remaining girls have fewer opportunities. Sorry, my mic here. 
As more girls drop out, the remaining girls have fewer opportunities to build community, fewer opportunities to connect and compete, which diminishes their experiences in sport and increases their likelihood to leave. If girls continue to leave sport, they miss out on the top benefits of sports participation for girls age six to 18. So looking forward into the future and the long-term impacts for communities, this also translates to increased mental and physical health costs uh, for society, decrease in uh, sports participation, low numbers of women in coaching and officiating, loss of talent. And it's important to note that there are already existing barriers to sport that have exacerbated, been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So just in closing, there are so many questions and a key question is where does this leave us in the world in which the COVID pandemic continues and will undoubtedly make significant impacts on our society and sport for generations to come? I know this is going to be a very rich discussion and I applaud the efforts of the organizing team, Richard, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Richard and each one of our panelists for diving in. <laughs> I look forward to hearing what more comes out of this series, and I hope that it includes intentional action to increase inclusion in sport for girls and women, not only here at this university, uh, at our university, but in the sector at large. And sport, just from a very personal standpoint, did so much for me when I was in elementary and high school and even college is such an important experience in the lives of girls and women. It's, it's definitely an opportunity we want to make sure that all women and girls continue to have in the future. So thank you again for including me. Uh, thanks so much to Dr. Green for that uh, wonderful opening. Uh, I'd like to continue on uh, with a land acknowledgement, and we begin today with a land acknowledgement to draw our attention to the physical place we are all connecting from today. We recognize this as an insufficient and transitory step requiring more learning and active movement towards justice for the Indigenous communities on whose land we are situated. This acknowledgement comes from the Aboriginal Education Council at Ryerson University. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory, territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. As we acknowledge these lands on which our modern society is built, we recognize that our action as non-Indigenous persons are vital in dismantling the structures of white settler colonialism that continue to disenfranchise these communities today. And now onto our panel, I would like to introduce Marika Warner, the Director of Research and Evaluation at MLSE Launchpad, who will moderate our session. Welcome, thanks to our panelists, Denise, Rich, and each of you for being here. I think you're in for a treat with a wicked slate of fiery, brilliant leaders in the sports space. Well curated, Rich, let's hear it for Dr. Norman. Great, now back to the women we've got. First up, the one and only Sharice Bacchus. Sharice has represented Trinidad and Tobago nationally, professionally, in international competition in track and field for more than 18 years. She's also recently been elected to the Canadian Soccer Association's Board of Directors, where she is looking to create a culture of diversity and inclusion while leading pursuit of excellence in soccer. And she also runs her own sport management, financial management firm. Sarah Barnes, Assistant Professor in the Department of Experiential Studies in Community and Sport at Cape Breton University, a former basketball player and coach with experience working in grassroots, university and international sport. 
we have Sharid Ahmed, a multi-platform sport journalist whose work focuses on Muslim women and girls and the intersections of race and gender in sport. She's the co-host of the Burn It All Down Feminist Sports Podcast, an instructor of sports media and journalism at X University and a regular contributor to TSN. And completing our lineup today, Suzanne Duncan, as the managing partner and co-founder of LA-based Integrated Sports Solutions, a partner with Fem Gaming and co-founder and board member of the Canadian Black Standard. Suzanne is an award-winning sport marketing maverick. Suzanne's experience is defined by successful orchestration and execution of integrated marketing solutions for global brands. And before we start, beyond the important themes of race and diversity in sport, uh, and gender equity in sport, I'd like to set the theme up for this conversation as let's go there. So please panelists, go there. I want our folks at home to be thinking, shoot, is she about to go there? Oh wow, she's going there. Oh damn, she just went there, et cetera, et cetera. So in that spirit, I'm gonna start broad um, and I'll ask our panelists, I'd like to hear from each of you on this question. In what ways do you believe that the sport industry is on the leading edge of the gender equity conversation? And in what ways is our industry lagging behind on these issues? And then how does race play into these areas of strength and weakness? First takers. Shereen, I'm looking at you. Okay, it's hard because of the squares, but okay. I was like, I'm good. Uh, hi everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Norman and Marika as well for hosting and moderating. Um, I. I think there's a lot of ways in which, and I'm being transparent here, I'm with media, there's a lot of ways in which uh, there's, I'll start with the exclusion, the deliberate exclusion, the lack of importance, and we're not just talking equitable pay, which is in itself what a story is. We're not just talking about abuse and the layers of abuse. We're not talking about, you know, racist systems that exist in sports. These are all stories. These are all things that need to be reported. And as someone who's in media, um, there's a lot of times where there's been gatekeeping in sport media or in sports journalism where the stories don't get amplified in the way they ought to be. And right now, I'm not going to call it a reckoning, but right now in sports media, we're seeing an overwhelming deluge and just a trigger warning for anyone about sexual assault and violence that we're seeing that emanate like with the Chicago NHL team, with the NWSL. I just reported on reaction um, with the K Women's National Team on the weekend. So there's a lot happening, but previously this wasn't thought of. So I will hold the media accountable and myself as well that things need to be disseminated. And they weren't. And then that's a problem. Um, so that's from an industry point as like an athlete, as a mom, there's things we simply don't wish to talk about. Sorry, my cat is screaming right now. So um, there's things that we don't want to get into that. Like, I don't want to complain about this because women's sports are so uh, seldom supported in the first place. So, you know, not only do women and girls and, and non-binary athletes have to deal with that, but they sort of like, we, sh we shouldn't say anything bad because we don't want to draw attention to it. So there's that obvious conundrum that I seen that I've experienced. So as somebody who was taken away from her sport because I decided to play hijab, um, I think that th I felt that. I felt I fell in love with a sport that didn't want to love me back. And that is unacceptable and it's not actually the problem. It's a symptom. The problem is the structures of power and control that exist in sport. And what can we do to change them? Mm, Suzanne? Well, I'd like to just offer a, 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 an additional perspective. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm the person on the panel that <laughs> is playing in the esports space. And, um, and, uh, and the and it's not even an infancy associated with these sports and, and gaming because it's been around a while. Most people are just tuned into it now, but it's been around. But what's been interesting um, is that some that esports and, and gaming has prided itself on showing up differently than traditional sports in this way. And yet, in fact, I think all you need to do is just put an, an E in front of sports, and you have the same challenges um, across the board. Um, both in terms of uh, the uh, construct of it, similar to what Shereen was saying, that at its foundations, it is, um, again, it's, it's uh, Caucasian male driven, primarily in the sense of how it's constructed. And so the same challenges uh, in the way that sports is meant to equalize and, and be the ultimate um, 
level playing field on the esports space, it is showing up the same way traditional sports does in the same way. Um, and, and yet similarly to, um, and actually even more in the space of esports, 49% of women are gamers and are esport players. And yet the construct is identical <laughs> The uh, is identical to the traditional uh, establishment of traditional sport. And so um, I think uh, I offer that out as perspective to say that it'll be that, that one informs the other. And if, and if, if what we're seeing sh in traditional sport is like this really elongated evolution of, of where um, uh, of equity in, uh, driven initiatives has taken a long time and for us to look at things and uh, um, highlight and message um, in non-biased, non-prejudicial uh, uh, um, ways, esports is showing up identical to the early, early beginnings of uh, traditional sports. So I just wanted to share that because I think that that's, it's a space people aren't as aware of and they always equate to being, well, that's totally different because it's a level playing field. It's not associated with physicality or the things that separate uh, re uh, gender, et cetera, in traditional sport. But it just told, tells you kind of what Shireen was saying, that at its core, the foundational construct is what dictates what the outcomes are later. Um, so uh, that's the gap that we need to fill um, in terms of uh, continuing the conversation, but also challenging the construct um, um, along the way, which is what which is what I'm hoping this conversation does. Fantastic. Let's go to Sarah. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for organizing all this. Thanks to my panelists. Um, in sort of preparing for this, I was sort of thinking about how amazing it is to get together on Zoom and to sort of have this conversation. I think one of the things that has been enabling it this event to happen is sort of this changing cultural common sense about the nature of sport and politics. So I think historically there's been this um, real push to think of politics or to think of sport as apolitical, um, as innocent, as a place where we want to keep politics out of. And so I think there's been a shift for a variety of reasons of recognizing the politics that are inherent in sport. And one of the questions that I think a lot of people are grappling with is how this sort of new type of wisdom around sport, is it gonna to lead to sort of tangible social change that actually um, addresses asymmetries, historic asymmetry changes the power structures, um, or will it sort of be appropriated and reproduce the status quo? And I think athletes have played a really big part in, in driving sort of these conversations. Um, and so I think through the panel, we're gonna be speaking a little bit more about that. Um, but I do find athletes' voices as ones that are really sort of pushing the envelope here. Um, when I think about the WNBA, the, Nash, the Canadian and American soccer teams, um, I think there's really exciting things of athletes who sort of have firsthand experience um, and are running into experiences of intersecting experiences of racism, sexism, and homophobia. Um, and so when I think of trying to push this beyond symbolic gestures, I really think that we need to look to athletes um, to understand uh, some, some tangible changes and, and where, to, um, where to lead us to next. Perfect segue into hearing from Sharice Faka. Thank you, Marika, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I think that, and this is me speaking from a uh, sport development and sport administrator perspective, and then also as an athlete. Um, every time I think we take, you know, a few strides forward in this area, we kind of get knocked down a few steps. And I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what um, Sarah said about athletes speaking up more and finding their voice a lot more. Um, that has been happening. And I want to mention something that happened, I think just this past weekend where, um, I won't say which sport because I don't want to put them on blast, um, where an uh, a U20 coach was kind of held under fire for having in a appropriate relationships with the um, women on the teams. And it was the athletes that came forward 
and you know wrote a letter to the media and kind of shone light on this issue and you see that happening a lot more which is a good thing because things like this tend to get swept under the rug but um it's good to see more athletes speaking up on these type of issues because back when i was competing you know it, very far and few um, few in between you know that you'd see that type of thing happening where, where a woman would feel empowered enough to say, you know, this is happening, this is wrong, you guys need to put certain constructs in place to prevent these type of things from happening. And as everyone else was saying, it goes down to the foundational construct and, and what protections being put in place for, for all of these issues. We really need to take a closer look at that and make strides towards um, putting better procedures in place. I'd like to move next to a topic that's very front of mind for me right now, both as a researcher and as a mother. So as a researcher, what I'm seeing coming out of MRT Foundation's 2021 Change the Game research study, which took an intersectional approach to assessing youth sport access, engagement, and equity in the wake of the pandemic, we learned that a third of girls aged 6 to 29 across Ontario are less interested in playing sports now than they were pre-pandemic across racial categories. And girls, particularly Black girls and young women, were less likely to have access to sport opportunities and more likely to have health and safety concerns relating to return to play. But those factors don't entirely explain that large drop in interest. So what are your theories about what is going on here? I'll just jump in. <laughs> uh, I think I think the first part that we need to acknowledge is that as a as a world as a nation we really experience um, a tremendous trauma um, that really started that has impacted everybody right and and mostly been really carried on the, the shoulders of women um, in particular. So. Um, like prior to the, the pandemic, right? We went in from the pandemic to the Me Too, Me Too movement, um, to the Black Lives Matter, which was really just a social, a racial and social awakening um, and polarizing politics. Um, and all of this comes down to the family unit, right? To uh, really women being impacted um, through uh, being removed from the workforce and, and also being heads of families. And so this trickles down to our, our girls and uh, young ladies. Um, and uh, because so much of our social conditioning is, is social interaction and engagement. And so the pandemic um, as a whole stressed everyone out. Um, our means to, um, to, to connect our, our, our social isolation actually has had a great deal of impact because sports is where people connect, is where young girls have their friends and they're all playing. And so um, that went away. And for underserved communities, uh, a lot of the times their participation in sports is as a result of their school as opposed to clubs. And so it's access into that that went away. Um, and then it's uh, that you're, and then, and then it's such a trickle down effect. Then your friends aren't playing. So now you're not playing because you can't. And then, and then add to that, that sports uh, and, and exercise and physical health and well-being is what eradicates a lot of our anxiety and our uh, mental toxins that it erases when you play and you do all that, not to mention our physical representation, what we, how good we feel about ourselves physically. So like it's a trickle down effect that would have occurred. Now you have uh, more social anxiety in young people. Now attach that for women to body image, not feeling in shape, not able to get back to it. Now your friends aren't doing it. And, and oh, you're also not being able to connect with your friends. So I think some of, some of that is, is attributed to that. I'd also say that, um, that some of in, in the intersection in speaking about race in particular, we, there was the, the trauma from that was almost like, it was almost like a double duty. <laughs> You've been hit by the, the pandemic has impacted everything, but then while it's happening, you've had the, the whole society in a state of unrest. And, and I think we think that it doesn't affect young people the same way, but it absolutely does. They're getting the feelings of it. They might not even know the, 
the details, but they're getting the feelings of it. And I think where we uh, don't have, where, where we haven't done maybe a good enough job is to just go back and check in to see where people, to see what they're feeling. And then the pandemic has actually allowed us a chance to pause and reset and to reset sort of where we, um, uh, how we how we address this to invite um, the participation back into sports, particularly for young 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 women. Thank you. I think Sharice, you're about to jump in. Yes, absolutely. And um, I definitely, as Susan said, you know, the brought its whole host of issues. You know, you know, people's anxiety went through the roof. Um, you know, back human connection, um, all these things that, you know, came with it. So that put, you know, a lot of added pressure on sport participation. And then also, I'd say it is, even though things are happening, a lot of the issues remain the same, lack of representation, you know, I don't my athlete have a hat on. Um, when I say representation, I mean, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ, everyone. Um, if I'm an athlete, I cannot see myself in the coaching staff. And even, um, I'll, I'll paint a broader brush, even the sport in general, if I don't see representation that looks like me and um, I have no one really to relate to, one, I'm not going to be, you know, you're not going to get 100% probably from the person. And then also that connections not there and once that connection's not there it's very easy for that person to now take a step back from the sport you know and then also um i'll touch on this i know susan touched on it before i think the body image issue is a huge 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 huge, huge area in participation in sport um especially during that um, period where a young woman is, you know, going into puberty, so that age from like 10 to, to about 16 now. Um, that is probably one of the most important times in sport for a woman when it comes to participation. And if it's not handled well, and if it's not handled delicately, you see a huge increase in, in the dropout participation. So um, a lot of times coaches and administration and staff, you know, they, they, they don't have the, the training that's required to, to, you know, communicate well with that young woman. Okay, um, there are issues where uh, situations where you know comments are made about their body you know comments are made about their performance a lot of times when a woman's body is changing her performance changes also and that's not understood a lot of times so it's a whole uh, a lot of issues that kind of come together that cause that that participation to go down if not handled well the the numbers skyrocket through the roof Thanks, Therese. Is there anything to add? Uh, not everyone needs to speak to every question, but feel free. Sure. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. I'm really enjoying hearing everybody's opinion. Um, I did, I always sort of go back to this idea of this fight for equality in sport also has to be coupled with um, a critique of sport always and understanding why sport might not always feel good for girls and women. So not to sort of pathologize girls and women, but to actually look at the types of conditions that they encounter in sport um, and to sort of build on um, a previous example. I'm coaching a girls basketball team right now and we don't necessarily have the best pinnies at the school. And so the pinny doesn't fit all the girls well. And so that is like a little type of uniform barrier that can make some people in that space maybe not feel as good right now um, when we're thinking about body image and um, and so it's things like this that we, I think we really need to be thinking um, about why sport doesn't always feel good about how new developments in terms of um, technology and data and tracking can actually um, amplify these issues by creating new forms of surveillance and data um, that can amplify these issues. So I think we need to pay attention to the old problems that have continuously 
um, sort of plagued women in sport and then see how they are changing and become new and gain new dimensions to this. So yeah, I think there's lots of problems that we need to address head on. Thanks, Sarah. And for Shireen, look forward to hearing your general comments, but we're all, I'm also wondering specifically if you can comment on the experiences of Muslim girls, young women, and non-binary youth as we move through our societal reopening. Have the enablers and barriers for participation in sport changed significantly? Thanks. Um, and then just to kind of scaffold off of what Sarah said, I mean, the idea of uniform accommodation is a big piece with young Muslim women and Muslim women in sport. I mean, it's something I've worked on my entire career, research into it and their involvement in it. And it uniform after after fees and pay to play systems in which many youth, you know, this is what the system is predicated on, um, uniform accommodation and lack thereof becomes the biggest barrier. And I'm not just talking about hijab specifically. And I do want to remind everyone that many in the Muslim community may not choose to wear a hijab, but they may choose to wear tights instead of shorts. And what does that look like? And are there conversations by teachers who are usually volunteers in the system? Or are they, or do they even have answers? Do they even know? Because in my experience, and this is why I also write one of my labels as a sport activists is to work towards inclusion in those spaces and the visceral reaction of most people if a youth asks them is no um, but do you actually uh, know if that's the answer I remember a particular incident where a mother of a rhythm gymnast she did rhythm gymnastics and acro wanted to wear a full unitard like a full as opposed to a small leotard like a leo and so the mother said to me the, the girls didn't wear hijab they were very young like eight and 11 but they didn't feel comfortable wearing a very short leotard also and a lot of this is actually very tightly bound to the idea of bodily agency and what are we teaching young girls here if we're saying well you can only do this if half of your butt is showing like that's not a things that a lot of young women may feel comfortable with irrespective of their faith so this is something that's not only about the muslim community needless to say i did some digging it helps to be a journalist and i got the rule book from the international federation and guess what they can absolutely wear a leotard so then the response from the mom she was like i don't want to you know, we're in a very all white space, which is something I feel I have to say that in pay to play and rep programs, there, it, it, it's a, there's a financial component here. So it's not depending on the sport. It may not always be as racially diverse um, as you know, we would like it to be. So anyway, I said to her, you can go and show them the actual rule book, which is 300 pages. And on this page, it says the girls are permitted by the International Federation. And secondly, tell them you have a friend who's a journalist. And nobody wants to hear that. So they were like, oh, yeah, oh, no, no, they can, they can absolutely wear it. So it takes, unfortunately, a certain amount of education on the part of the coaches, but also on the part of parents. And what rights do those children have? What rights do they have as athletes and as individuals? What happens when you have a non-binary and binary or trans player who's not comfortable to be in either a gender fluid athlete who doesn't want to be in the men or women's? What accommodations can you make? We have set up structures for young girls and the gender non-conforming on white men male systems. Are we prepared to go forward in those systems or make amends? Or are we going to like rebuild systems? I mean, I literally have a podcast called burn it all down. So you know where I fall on that side of the issue. Amen. Okay. So <laughs> moving right along, even with fewer girls interested in sports at this time, and fewer girls in child and youth sport programs in many settings, we're seeing a lot more attention on women's professional sports with a lot more media coverage, public discourse, especially around this year's WNBA playoffs. Of course, alongside that, we're seeing consistent backlash, a lot of commentary along the lines of, I quote, no one gives a fuck, it's the W, even when it's abundantly clear that we do, in fact, care a lot. So what are some factors explaining both that growth and visibility that we've seen this year and that tenacity of that narrative that no one cares? And how does the prominence of the Black Lives Matter movement play into that? I just gonna let you all go. I, I, I can, one thing I think is really interesting is that there's now some really interesting data coming out of some different women in sport um, research centers, Tucker Center in the States, E-Alliance, Canadian Women, and they're actually sort of collecting data uh, to challenge this myth. So I think there's really good, um, we're starting to get the data to challenge that, that myth that no one cares about these sports. And so I think those are important to get the Get them, get the viewership, have understand who's watching. Um, because I do think that that's a myth. Um, 
So that's just what I wanted to add there. Yeah. Anyone else? I'll, I'm happy to jump in on this one just because I'll, I think one of the things that's really we have to be very clear about is black women in particular have been the blueprint of hand, how to handle things and manage a uh, social justice issue. And, and with regards to the W, uh, queer black women in particular have offered a path that nobody knew how to do after the murder of George Floyd. And I think that many, and including encouraging the Black Players Coalition of the NWSL. Now I can't speak specifically to Canada because all you all know, it's a failure of this country that we don't have a single domestic women's league, not basketball, not soccer and not ice hockey. So I will be talking about that also and totally dropping shade because that is relevant to the conversation we're having. Young athletes in this country cannot play professionally in this country without, you know, in a sustainable domestic league, they can play with the NWHL with the Toronto six or the CW, the former CWHL, which is a PWHPA fine, but they can't otherwise. So they got to leave. So there's all these systems. Now the W being this incredible league that it is, is also never conflated the fact that sports are not political, particularly for racialized athletes, for women athletes, they're out there advocating for, and we saw in the WNBA playoffs, Chicago Sky's literally wearing shirts that talk about reproductive rights and abortion as healthcare. So this is part of the thing and why there's such tremendous educators two young girls to say you ha should have agency on your body. And yes, keeping in mind the conversations in the United States are different than the ones we're having here. Um, hopefully those conversations don't come here. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that essentially there's a way to teach. And that was, I believe, intentional, particularly around issues of sport. They had the names of Breonna Taylor so, so much. Like they dedicated their entire you know, wobble season to Brianna Taylor. They remember the names. They remind us that there's ways to use platform. I think that's incredibly powerful and it's potent. And I think, uh, I think it was Sarah that was talking about, or Suzanne perhaps about the power that fans wield. And we can't forget that if we consider sports as a, as, as a, you know, three pronged um, with media, with athletes, and with fans and community. And I just want to bring to the attention and, and transparency here, I'm on the advisory committee of the Black Girl Hockey Club and the work that they do and how they've literally made community and family out of a sport that would normally reject Black women and racialized folks from those spaces. So, you know, like I think the anti-oppression can fit into sport. It's just, are we letting it and where? And I do want to remind people out there that there are those com communities that are committed to anti-oppression in sports and just got to find them. And social media has been brilliant for that. Thanks so much. Um, anything to add, Suzanne, Sharif? Me? <laughs> Well, you may, or we can move on. Not, no, no, I just wanted to add something to that. <laughs> Thanks, Sheree. I just wanted to add on the note of platforms. Um, platforms are really powerful when you're winning. Like you have everyone's attention. So I think the Olympics are an indication of that. Obviously, women dominated were winners. Uh, and therefore, um, I think similarly in soccer, as we looked at the platform that Megan Rapinoe had, um, to, to, to discuss and drive um, the conversation around equity, again, off of a winning platform that showed that there were commercial dollars, there were resources behind it, but they were winning. Similarly, um, I think um, um, Naomi Osaka, a winner, um, top grossing commercial <laughs> money maker in sport. Again, using women using their platforms has forced the media to create dimensionality and how athletes are presented, particularly female athletes. So if we look at Alison Felix showing up using her power um, to, to share a, a more dimensional look about an athlete who also was a mother, who also was coming back and, and who faced this uh, um, additional assaults after being a winner and a champion. If you look at Simone Biles coming in as being the um, quintessential winner um, and, and putting using her platform, again, showing up with more than one dimension. The media is, is starting to portray women um, uh, as having multiple sides instead of one dimensional. And whereas they've done that for men in the past, they, they've heroized that they've made them heroes of, you know, um, uh, in, in their personal spaces, in their, you know, giving back community spaces. We think about LeBron's and all such 
uh, they focused on that and haven't done as much of that with women, but now that's changing. And I think that that, again, if we're thinking about young women seeing where they can go, they're seeing their whole selves being represented instead of, um, and, and again, all of that done because people like winners on the platform of, of dominating in sport and therefore driving the value to that. Glad you went there. Therese, anything to add? Absolutely. First, let me apologize. I can't see anyone on, on screen, so I'm saying all your cues, all your cues, Marika. <laughs> um, but definitely, I think that that um, I'm going to go in a little different direction. I think we're in a good space right now, and I'll piggyback off what Suzanne was saying with how the Olympics, you know, the women's team, the women's soccer team did such a great job. And um, you'd think that it would be a seamless process to, to get sponsorship and to, you know, all the good things that come with you winning and succeeding. But I, I honestly think that there's a bit of a disconnect, okay, because it's still a bit of a struggle for those things to kind of develop and to be put in, and to be, um, put in place after the fact that you... I don't think a men's team would ever have these types of issues, you know, if they just finished winning an Olympic gold and you wouldn't think that they'd have problems getting like sponsorship, broadcast deals, X, Y, Z, but that's still happening, you know? So I think with women's sport, there's still a bit of a disconnect. Okay. And we still have a lot of work to do in that area. Do we ever? Oh, all right. So now just for fun, it's well, it's never really just for fun. But if you were a betting woman, would you say that Canada is more likely to get an NFL team or a WNBA team in the next five to 10 years? And maybe a little bit on why, please. Back to Sharif. Oh, I'll go first. <laughs> Since my mic is on. Um, I think we definitely have the space for a WNBA team. I think, and you know, I'm a female athlete, so I'm completely biased, I'll say that for one time. Um, I would love to see that happen. I'd love to see us go in that direction. But money talks. And I think that in the space of, of getting an NFL team, that may happen before, just simply because money may be thrown behind that, but that also comes with a lot of complications. You know, you have the CFL in place already. I think and if an NFL thing is going to be implemented, it would have to be in Toronto. Toronto already has a CFL team. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer. I would absolutely love a WNBA team to, to be implemented. I think we definitely have the space I think, you know, Canada is, uh, uh, has a landscape of such rich opportunity. I think you can definitely conjure up the funds to do so. Whether it will happen, that's a whole other, other um, issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone? Um, I don't bet, but I'm happy to amplify the stories and the need for one. So that would be great. I think that there's enough, we live in a big enough city to foster that kind of encouragement. And again, you build it, they will come, which is, I think, baseball. And I don't even do baseball, but whatever. I mean, the Jays lost, it's all good. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that we need to, it's not just about investing in women. Like, the product is amazing. We already know this. So let's just, you know, hook it up. Van. I have so many thoughts on this. I, I, I'm, I'm so, I'm with Sharice. Like I, I believe there's every reason why there should be and why, and there's opportunity. And again, um, if it does happen, it would likely happen in, in Toronto in the 905 in this space, because that's, I'm positive that's where it would start first. But I, I think I'm like Sharice. I think it's, it, it's again, it's, it's money, money's going to make those decisions. And so I'm, I'm thinking it's, but, 
but again, the complexity of NFL <laughs> this is CFL and there's not exactly, yeah, the, there's a lot of Canadian pride about there being a difference in those games. And so I, I think it'd be really, really challenging and complex, but I, 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 be, I really want there to be a WNBA team. I really want that. It's aspirational, but I want that. All right, Sarah, anything on that? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I had the opportunity to live in Atlanta for a little bit of time and the dream was the best part of living there. <laughs> so uh, I would love to see a WNBA franchise in Canada. And I think there's a great base of basketball. There's also a really good university of basketball. So I, I'd, I'd love to see that happen. Great. Right. So I am a betting woman. My money is also on the W. Um, so, but let's get serious again. I'm going to put out one more question here and then we'll go to, we're getting some great questions in the Q and A. Um, just getting a flag from Rich. We're going to go about 10 minutes over time. So for those of you watching the clock, uh, please keep that in mind. So we're going to get a little bit serious again. I'm going to head over to federal politics. With the re-election of the Trudeau Liberals, a lot of us in the industry anticipated that there might be a new Ministry of Sport created, and the Cabinet announcement on Tuesday confirmed that, with Pascal Saint-Ong appointed as the Minister of Sport, as well as the Minister responsible for Economic Development in Quebec. So how can the creation of this new role, this new ministry, be leveraged to impact gender and racial equity in Canada's sports system? Whoever would like to go, please do so. I'll go. Um, I believe that with the new ministry, hopefully that will bring on oodles of funding. And I think it will be best served if you allocate that funding and you really put that into sporting programs for schools. Um, I always believe that school has a chance as a good tool to be like the great equalizer. Um, but you'd have to do this through a um, state organization like um, School Sport Canada or um, OFSAA. If you were to implement really good grassroots programs statewide, I think that would really help to level the playing field because now every child has access to these programs and school has always been an amazing breeding ground for talent. Um, and also, I think if you also use this program and help to, to focus it on areas that are marginalized or, or um, at-risk areas and you really focus the, the programs in, in those areas, I think that would really help to level the playing field. Anyone else on this question before we move on? Um, I'd like to sway and I'd just like to say that I think the, the uh, creation of this position is sort of confirmation um, of the federal government's commitment to understanding that sport is a healing element and that um, it's sort of recognition that in order for the country to heal, there needs to be um, something greater than all, all, all the mechanisms that are put in place, a greater that, that touches all levels of community and that sport at its foundation does that. And so committing a position specific to that, to me is, uh, is, is, the federal rec government's recognition that that's what's going to create uh, healthier um, um, communities that's going to foster well-being and help healthier communities all around. I think the, the um, appointment of uh, Pascal Saint-Ange and because she's been an advocate of, of uh, gender equity and she's um, and and um, she's been heavily involved in terms of cultural programs as well. I think that that's a positive sign. I likewise think putting Marcy Ian in place, I'm hoping there's cross-pollination there so that the lens is, is crosses gender, all the intersects, if you will, gender, uh, race, culture, et cetera. But I think it happening at the federal level means again, and that there'll be some resources, i.e. funding, i.e. Uh, money that then to Teresa's point hits perhaps the grassroots level so we can start to rebuild because that's the only way it's gonna work. 
less money is going towards high performance. And now we've got to rebuild at the grassroots community level. Um, and likewise, her being there, let's be real, like women in governments, governance make the difference. So that's a positive sign all the way around, I think. Thanks so much, Suzanne. And to Shereen's point earlier, you know, build something better. Um, anyone else on that question? Yeah, just to, uh, oh, so, uh, um, you know, again, what Suzanne's saying and what, uh, based on what Sharice had said about grassroots, it's where we get an opportunity for children to thrive. And we get, you know, I, I'm based in Toronto and uh, there are Muslim women basketball leagues, there's Filipino basketball leagues in the volleyball sector, there's East Asian leagues, there's Chinese leagues, like these, this is stuff that had been created in spite of sport in the mainstream, not because of it. And I think there's ways that we need to think about different communities. Like there's a gay hockey club close to where I live. And that was created out of almost um, a response to not being included in the mainstream. And what can be done to support those local, very local and important initiatives that we didn't intend to disrupt, but have beautifully done so and given family sport as well. So I think these are things that we, we also need to take into consideration at a government level I mean, it kind of shocks me that there was no minister of sport to begin with. And, you know, and when you've got top women, I, I know we don't want to focus on high performance, but when the gold medalist of the Canadian women's team is using their platform, literally after they won gold, they talked about not having a league to play at home. in. now they're using the victory tour to talk about a culture of silence and abuse in the sport. So like, you know, they're using that platform and they are, you know, the best of the best in this country. And they're saying there needs to be more work done. So there needs to be a lot of work done. Beautiful, let's hear from Sarah and then we'll take some Q and A. Yeah, I just have to echo basically what the panel has said. I, I think the policy matters and in, in the climate. I think uh, at a federal level though, that does really mean more for on the podium and high performance streams and the majority of girls and women will not be playing in those sports. So I think it's yet to be seen what this will translate to, I think uh, provinces are more in charge of recreational systems. And so that's more of a patchwork across the country. Um, so I think once again, as everybody else has mentioned, local, local clubs um, disrupting uh, mainstream sport um, and sort of finding interesting ways to uh, express themselves, flourish and uh, create great communities. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to whip through these questions to try to get to as many as possible. So maybe we'll have one respondent per question unless folks have something burning that they need to say. Uh, so we have a question from Mo Dean. What's up, Mo? Um, who's been lobbying the city of Montreal to grant ice time to get girls on the ice. And his question is, what do you see as the major barrier for girls and women to work? Is it cities, infrastructure, sport authorities? What's the roadblock? I think it, it, I think it lots of local conditions that come together in very particular ways. Um, I think hockey that sort of goes right to the heart of the institution. Um, like getting ice time is a big deal, and so I, I'm not sure there's just one thing across the country that would happen that we could say universally this is the thing. Um, maybe others would disagree, but. Um, you're going right when, when you want the resources, the same resources and equitable resources, this is when sort of the rubber hits the road. Okay, so this one goes specific to Sharice. Um, Sharice mentioned the importance of coaches handling things well to encourage participation amongst adolescent girls because it's such a critical time with all the factors that we've been speaking about today. Uh, and this um, attendee is asking for tips to, in order to handle that optimally. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of training available on how you can, you know, coach and how you can, can communicate well during that period of time, you know, when a woman is you know, going through puberty and her body's going through different, tra different changes. Um, you can find these programs to learn how com to communicate and then you can also find these programs to learn how to coach because a woman's body, it's changing, her performance is going to change, so your coaching now has to change to accommodate that. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, so then we have a question actually from Dr. Norman. Um, someone on his the last panel in this series said, uh, to paraphrase, take the money away from the old white men and give it to us. So we know what to do with it. 
what does the panel think about that as a course of action? I want to ask who we is. Um, I'm very particular to ask because we have seen white women commit harm and uphold systems of patriarchy in these spaces. So I want to be really clear about that. And are we being inclusive? I actually had someone say to me, um, well, we're going to do uh, a little bit of inclusion, uh, you know, conditional inclusion. And I'm like, mm, that's not inclusion. If you're going to be, and there's a war on trans youth in the United States in sports, and that could very easily, you know, filter its way to this space as well, and I mean country. So when we say we know what to do with it, I think we need to learn as much about, you know, anti-Black racism and anti-homophobia and transphobia as well as I don't think that anyone has done it well that I've seen other than the W, which also is not perfect. I mean, there's players working and doing any, I know for a fact that PWHPA is taking anti-oppression and anti-racism education training that was at the best of the players with Dr. Courtney Sito, uh, basic queen. So this is very important stuff. So I'm, I'm just gonna ask who we is. I know I'm a journalist, but I'm asking the questions. Who is we? I've been notified that this is a black person. I don't know anything more about them. I, I meant like collective we, like, like who okay, is the we okay. that no, I don't, I'm not pointing fingers at the question person. I'm saying like, who is we to, to move forward? Cause we don't all have, and we're not on a monolith, right? So like who yeah, is yeah. doing that? Great, great. Okay. Thanks Shereen. Okay, so then Tanya Phillips, and I just want to shout out Tanya Phillips as well for all the gems that she has been dropping in the chats this afternoon. So Tanya asks, what do you think longstanding institutions like Commonwealth Games can do to help improve equity in sport, especially for women and girls? Okay. Chase, are you going? <laughs> I'll pop in. Well, like Shireen said, to her point, burn it all down. I think a lot of these um, older federations, they have a lot of issues in those areas. Because if you look at any of the, the um, management escape or, or um, the people who are in positions of power, it's usually a bunch of white men. So mm -hmm. they would have to really fundamentally start changing to their core before that's trickled down to administration, to staff, to athletes. So yeah. and in, these, in these areas, they tend to like to hold on to the power and you know, hold on to these archaic ways. So short of a revolution and bring it all down to the ground, you really have to do a lot of work to, to completely break it down and rebuild it. Fantastic. Thanks, Sharice. And I'm going to come back with one more question somewhere I was really hoping that we could go today um, just to try to kick up the spice a, a level with one more question. So over the past several days, we have witnessed a major sport adjacent controversy playing out in our local chapter of the Old Boys Club with a dramatic public conflict between board members and executives within Rogers Communications. And I would like to invite our panelists to reflect on the role of gender and race dynamics in how this scandal is continuing to play out. Um, you know, when you posed this, when this question came up, I really was stuck, stuck a little bit because I feel like that struggle represents exactly some of the greatest challenges we've talked about here. It's a, it's a, it's a construct um, of, of, of wealth and privilege in a space that <laughs> I kept thinking, okay, how, what, how, how do we connect this? Um, and then part of me thinking, it's so wrong, I don't even want to touch it because the conflict as it relates, right, as, as it's come out, right, you have, is not, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't draw a correlation except to say that the power playing of the extremely wealthy and the privilege and the audaciousness that came in uh, between family members and mostly the male family member and then the, um, is, is part and parcel to what sort of what we're talking about in general is that, the powerful affect, 
are up here playing with the hole and and we and we um, uh, end up being watching in this case and and yet impacted because in Canada we we have the big three or we have a as it relates to that industry and they're all controlling what we get as outcomes but I couldn't I, I, I was trying to make the correlation and thinking about this question to begin with is how it impacted it's the haves and the have nots it's race it's gender but it's within their uh, their that construct and the audaciousness that comes from privilege to me that allows you to say I'm just going to make this decision and create a whole new thing uh, and that's power um, so I yeah I, I struggled with this one because I couldn't make the connection for I think it's it speaks to the stem of everything we have to as, as Shireen says burn it all down across the board start over and 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 the key to like we cannot it just can't be said enough women have to get into the decision making uh and and uh positions of power in order to influence and they can't as Shireen said be just Caucasian women That's, there it is <laughs> it just doesn't get any clearer than that it Otherwise, nothing changes. And I also wanted to share that the burden um, that, that I personally see as being placed on particularly racialized women is coming in as DEI people, expecting them to cure the ills of society and, and, and systemic constructs from years as the solution to it all. And I'm sorry, I digressed on that, but it's it's top of mind, right? And and that it, that the, the Maybe the, maybe the biggest piece that we can take from all of this is that we all have responsibility at whatever level we are to affect this change that we want to see. And it has to start with intention and it also has to be a business imperative with dollars attached to it or nothing changes. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I was just going to say, yeah, this is a real opportunity to think a little bit about capitalism and to think about um, the way that race and gender intersect with capitalism and the, you know, and, and how sport is actually something that really fuels inequalities in our society, like high performance sport can be something that actually can fuel major differences uh, and wealth inequality in our society. So I actually think there's an opportunity to think more about class politics here and bring that into that conversation. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anything to add on to Shereen? Shereen, before I pass back to Rage to wrap her up. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just about to reach for my matches over here, but um, I'll hand it back over to Rich. Oh, wow. Um, when I was putting this panel together, I mean, I didn't think it would disappoint. And it's certainly, you know, this is the expectation. I, I want to thank every single one of you for being part of this. Um, I can't wait once we deconstruct, you know, sport, what, you know, you all are going to contribute to rebuilding it in a better and different way. So thank you, Sharice, uh, Suzanne, Marika, um, uh, Sarah, and Shireen. I really appreciate every one of you being here and giving your perspectives. Uh, thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours specifically, but I think you know we framed this discussion in, in such an amazing way that hopefully you got um, some really you know good nuggets that you can take away. Um, thank you again to, you know, the people who have been supporting this project and Dr. Green for jumping on today. Um, the, one of the things I hate about webinars is we kind of all say goodbye at the same time. <laughs> so, um, again, I really appreciate all of you for being uh, panelists and, and Marika for being the moderator today. Um, wonderful discussion. Um, I hope to keep these going, but this is the last panel in the series for this year and um you know i hope to see you all in in 2022 so thank you again thank you for the opportunity thanks Sirich. congratulations on, on coordinating a great set of discussions too thank you everybody have a great day thank you everyone <laughs>